you very much, uh, Prof. Vinod and also uh, Miss Sahana right, for inviting me to share uh, you know, our experience on the pharmacogenomics related research. Yeah? So um, I thought I would choose this uh, title, Pharmacogenomics of Oncology, and whether or not it is a necessity for clinical translation, especially in our country. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, I think I will first start with what position health is because it looks very much like, you know, uh, you know, we are actually into the another era of genomic medicine whereby precision health basically is, you know, being coined a lot of time, right? And also in US, in fact, in 2019, CDS Office of Public Health Genomics has already changed their office. Yeah? The name of the office now is Office of Genomics and Precision Public Health. Yeah? And that actually helps to reflect uh, the increasing emphasis of using uh, genomics as well as non-genomic precision health application in a public health. So as you can see uh, in the CDC website, you know, um, they have listed four objectives and one of it is clearly stating that avoid serious effect from medication. So for me, this actually uh, relates very well with this uh, the aim and objective of pharmacogenomics so far, right? So, um, yeah, why pharma, uh, precision health is important? Uh, basically, precision health nowadays, uh, it actually uh, combine data from, uh, you know, individual about their genes, their environment, their lifestyle, so that actually uh, to allow us to predict or the condition to predict and actually prescribe a better and more precise medication. So for me, uh, precision health basically, you know, will encompass a bigger population of people where industry also can come in to ensure that, you know, the health of the population is being maintained or improved by using correct nutrients and things like that. Well, you know, there is a small population of people that are unhealthy, right? And this this will be where precision medicine that will come in. So precision medicine in terms of definition include, you know, uh, to support personalized healthcare decision making using genomic, biological, behavioral, environmental and uh, data on individual. Whereas precision health is integration of all this, yeah, including genomics and non-genomics uh, approach yeah, uh, and other precision medicine intervention so that we can actually practice in real world. So I thought this precision health will relate very well with uh, what do you call that pharmacogenomics. So pharmacogenomics objective, uh, I mean, from day one, it has been trying to personalize treatments. So um, um, this is basically a, a, a diagram by this author, right, in 2015. All right, they actually simulated, you know, a population with uh, uh, the one size fit all kind of uh, approach whereby all the patients with similar symptoms, you know, they will be prescribing, uh, they will be prescribed one medication. And then the doctors will just observe and see, you know, who actually will have good response, who don't respond and who have average reaction. But with this pharmacogenomics, what we can do is we can actually put in pharmacogenetics testing here before actually given, you know, before prescribing medicine to the patients so that the patients can be given either standard dose for these people that are going to have good response and uh, maybe a dose adjustment for people that have sort of like, you know, different genetic variants or background that actually reduce or require lower dose. And ultimately, we want to achieve good response also for this group of people. And there will be probably one group of outliers here usually that experience adverse drug reactions. So all these three groups like in generally will be able to be predicted from uh, pharmacogenetic tests so that we can actually prescribe the correct medicine as well as correct dosage of medicine to uh, patients. So basically, this is a very uh, good uh, and, and nice you know, objective of pharmacogenomics for me. All right. So as, as, as we know now, actually, there are about like, you know, more than 100 drugs approved for cancer treatment. Yeah? And still, there are about 800 in clinical development. However, the precise therapy is not there to ensure we reduce the mortality. Yeah? And that is also because mortality is basically strongly related to efficacy of treatments. right? Okay, so if we look into uh, um, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics variation, that 
result in variation in drug response. You can see that pharmacokinetic actually there are also many sources of variability that include gender, race, body size, right? And of course, one of it is uh, genetics. Lah. And same as for pharmacodynamic, right? But the issue with uh, pharmacology oncology uh, is that, you know, as of today, there are a large number of therapeutic options available. So which drug we want to choose for which patients? How do we predict which uh, patient will respond to which drug, right? And also the problem is uh, we are facing with uh, oncology is there are low response rates. So how many percent of patients actually responded to the chemotherapy drugs? It's very low, right? And also there are high incidence of de novo and acquired resistance or from the tumor cells, you know, when the tumor cells get exposed to the uh, chemotherapeutic agents, they get mutated and then the, the, the tumor become resistance, right? And also severe toxicity because these are anti-cancer medicines. So uh, some people may have uh, genetic variations that cause them to be at an increased risk of toxicity. So all these are issues with related to uh, oncology, right? So how does this pharmacogenetics can help? Right, in preventing and also predicting, you know, who should be given what drug. Yeah. At uh, the global objective of pharmacogenomics, basically, you know, for pharmacogenomics, we'll be targeting at two two big ones. One is to maximize therapeutic effect. The other one is to minimize adverse effect. Right. So in uh, in maximizing the therapeutic effect, what we need to know is whether or not the patients actually have the drug receptors. Because if patients don't have the drug receptors, then uh, we usually, uh, they are not the correct candidate to put on their drug, right? For example, um, Herceptin. Herceptin has to be given to patients, you know, whereby their tumor cell express HER2, right, for patients to be able to respond. Whereas, uh, there's another problem with this drug receptor, uh, drug transporter that we call P-glycoprotein, P whereby, um, you know, tumor cells, they are very clever when they are exposed with this uh uh, chemotherapeutic agents, they actually increase the expression of this efflux pump. So they pump out drugs from the tumor cells and then, you know, uh, the tumor cells just do not get enough of chemotherapeutic drugs to be killed, right? And uh, the other one is actually minimizing adverse effect. So when minimizing adverse effect, we will have to see uh, uh, whether or not the host, for example, the patients carry the correct enzymes to actually metabolize the drugs. Uh, of course, there are two types of drug, whether the drug is a uh, pro-drug or whether it is an active drug. All right. So, for example, in pro-drug cases, right, like, for example, tecmosifen actually uh, was being sort of like, you know, uh, having another metabolite that is endoxifen that is more active. Yeah. So in this case, tecmosifen is considered as pro-drug. And tecmosifen will require CYP2D6 to be, to convert it to endoxifen. So, uh, patients having low enzyme of CYP2D6, they would actually have low level of endoxifen and that actually resulting in subtherapeutic effect of tecmosifen on these patients, right? And, uh, yeah. Whereas for, you know, metabolites that is toxic, for example, there is one anti-cancer drug that is irinotecan. They produce toxic metabolite that is called SN33, uh, 38. And this SN38, uh, require wow. one phase two, uh, enzyme to actually in de deactivate it. So people with poor metabolizing enzyme of phase two, uh, would again suffer toxic effect. Yeah. The other one is something that is called idiosyncratic adverse effect. That could be due to, uh, you know, patient having HLA polymorphism, right? And this uh, adverse effect would be difficult to um, predict because it is not dose related. Therefore, uh, pre-genotyping will be essential, right? To first detect patients who have certain genotype profile that actually will increase their risk to uh, adverse reactions, yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, before I go on with the examples of drugs that actually have some implications for pharmacogenetics, I will first, you know, want to uh, get through with this slide whereby, you know, um, 
I just want to define what is germline and what is actually somatic kind of mutations, right? So in terms of cancers, right, uh, so far there are about 300 genes, cancer genes that has been detected, but about 80% actually are a mix of, um, what do you call that, somatic, uh, sorry, about 80%, 228 are actually uh, due to somatic mutations, whereas there are another 10% that is due to a mix of somatic and germline mutations, and uh, there are 10% of cancer genes that are actually due to germline mutations. So the difference between germline and somatic is that for germline mutations, the variance is already present in the gamut. And what it means is that that mutation will pass down to the offspring. Whereas somatic mutations are variants that occur during uh, fatal development or any time during their lifetime, right? For example, when somebody that don't, they are normal, actually, the, the parents pass them normal gene, but somehow they are actually exposed to UV or some, uh, you know, some mutagenic kind of re uh, agents that cause the cells to mutate, then that causes cancer and that is basically a somatic variance. So gem, gem line, uh, this slide basically, um, you know, I just want to sh share four, four gene products or four genetic polymorphism that has been, uh, highly or extensively studied with regards to pharmacogenomics. Yeah. So these are gem line variants that has been reported to, uh, affect or modify treatment outcome. Yeah. So one of it is, uh, TPMT, uh, enzyme. The other one is uh, DPYD, and this is phase two uh, enzyme, the uh, UGT1A1, and this is phase one enzyme, CYP2D6, right? And this is a drugs that actually they are involved in terms of metabolis metabolism. So this allele of TPMT, for example, star 3A, star 3C, and star 2, has resulted in increased toxicity. Please ignore this uh, polymorphism thing. It's supposed to be here. All right. Whereas DPYD star 2A, responsible for the metabolism of uh, 5 furouracil actually, uh, you know, patients carrying this variant will have increased toxicity. Same as for UGT1A1 star 28, have resulted in increased toxicity in patients put on irinotecan. And CYP2D6 star 4, which resulting in poor metabolizing enzyme uh, status of patients, have resulted in a decreased efficacy of tetmosephan. So what I want to show here in the chart is this is phase one uh, drug metabolizing enzyme. As you can see, there are about 18 families of cytochrome P450 enzymes. And this is the biggest phase one uh, uh, enzyme for cytochrome P450, right? Whereas CYP, uh, and CYP2D6 contribute to about 25% of drugs that they metabolize, CYP2D6 here. Yeah? All right, and this is basically phase two uh, metabolizing enzyme and UGTs actually contribute to a major percentage of phase two drug metabolizing enzyme. And these are uh, uh, enzymes that are polymorphic yeah, in terms of uh, metabolism of uh, drug. And then, uh, all right, there are actually uh, somatic mutations in target target genes that also has been reported to modulate response to kinase inhibitor. Uh, basically, kinase inhibitor are targeted therapy that has been designed or developed yeah, uh, to direct against cancer-specific molecules and signaling pathway. And they are uh, thought to actually have limited non-specific toxicity. But somehow, there are also polymorphism with regards to all these receptors Right. And resulting in different efficacy, right? Different sensitivity or resistance towards drugs. So, uh, if it will be nice, actually, you know, before you put patients on these uh, drugs, right? Uh, like imitinib and things like that, right? Uh, the patient status with regards to this gene expression would have already been uh, determined in the patients. Eh? For example, in this particular table, right, there are already many mutations that are already being uh, um, identified for this BCR gene. And uh, the dose of this uh, kinase inhibitor, right, actually differ in, in different uh, genetic variations. So what it shows here is that genetic mutations that actually affect the dose that, you know, uh, you should prescribe to the patients. This is a summary of all the um, relevant enzymes that uh, will be uh, useful for 
pharmacogenomics of oncology. For example, you know, uh, many studies has already shown that DPYD polymorphism do affect pi view, right? Um, efficacy in patients on colorectal cancer, right? So it should be you know, patients with colorectal cancer before they are put on 5 uracil, they would or they should be genotype for DPYD polymorphism. And same as for uh, uh, TYMS, another gene that actually are uh, also showing um, uh, different kind of uh, efficacy for 5-chlorouracil and uh, MTHFR for 5-chlorouracil and metatrazate. Um, yeah, TPMT for thiopurine drugs in patients with leukemia, and UGTA1A1, uh, you know, for treatment with irino taken in colorectal cancer patients, especially those with metastatic kind of cancers. Right. And uh, this is another group of, 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 of uh, polymorphism that uh, will be, um, you know, probably a good reference for uh, the medical doctors as well, you know, to refer to and to get more information as in, you know, whether this should be studied before you put on um the patients yeah put the drugs on the patients um with that that is basically a general kind of um, uh, introduction about phar pharmacogenomics or oncology but uh, after this what i'm going to sh share with you is the research that we have actually conducted in our institute right and uh, we actually started our uh, project uh, looking very much on population polymorphism uh, poly, popul population polymorphism and we have identified especially this gene sip 2 d 6 uh, that actually are pretty polymorphic uh, actually in malaysia we have three major ethnic groups that is malay chinese and uh, indian right so we genotype this patient uh, this healthy individual and we classify the healthy into individual to four predicted kind of phenotypes and as as we can see here uh, in among the malays actually we have like two percent of poor metabolizer whereas the chinese in malaysia uh, none of them were actually found to have uh, to carry any uh, null allele so we predicted it to be uh, zero percent of poor metabolizer of chinese in malaysia and and that actually uh, also uh, correlate very well with data from uh, chinese from china right and uh, for the Indian in Malaysia, for, with regards to CYP2D6 polymorphism, we detected about 4%, 4.7% 4%, uh, of a uh, uh, poor metabolizer of CYP2D, uh, CYP2D6. Whereas uh, with regards to IM, that is due to, you know, very commonly due to mutations of STATIN of CYP2D6. So the Malay and Chinese having pretty similar frequency of STATIN mutations. Yeah? Uh, whereas the Indian actually... Uh, um, having less than 20% of uh, IM. Uh, and uh, yeah, the Indian uh, in Malaysia, they are pretty similar with the Caucasian in the sense that uh, majority of them are actually EM, right? So why is this data important? Besides, uh, as I mentioned earlier, CYP2D6 actually were responsible for 25% of the uh, metabolism of drugs, right? Uh, and one important drug that is being used uh, in oncology is tetmosifen. So from this data, we can predict that, you know, uh, well, maybe 5% of the Indian would not respond to tetmosifen or having reduced efficacy, right? Whereas among the Malay and Chinese, you know, uh, it will be probably more than 50%, 50 to 60%, I mean, 50% uh, 50% of the Malay and Chinese would not respond to uh, tetmosifen. And we further looked into, uh, actually, uh, after that, we actually used whole genome sequencing to study uh, subpopulations of uh, our aborigines. And we also found that, actually, you know, um, uh, a high percentage of these aborigines that we have, yeah, they about 66.2%, they actually metabolize the drug very slowly yeah so they are either im or pm so this group of people will basically have adverse drug reaction uh, 
drug effect if the uh the this CYP two D six are required to metabolize the active drug to inactive drug, whereas they will actually suffer therapeutic uh, failure. For example, tamoxifen because this CYP two D six is required to convert tamoxifen to endoxifen. So um, we are a high percentage of the aborigines in Malaysia are not going to respond very well with the uh tamoxifen and any drugs that uh, you know, um, for example, other drugs, other substrates of CYP two D six, they probably are going to have adverse effect. Yeah. And uh, this is another enzyme that also we study in the uh, using whole genome sequencing and profile it in the orang asli. And again, we find that uh, the orang asli in Malaysia, they about more than fifty percent of them are actually known as presser of CYP three A four. And these are the list of drugs that actually uh, uh, require CYP three A five yeah to metabolize. And uh, in this study, we also develop a simple uh, HRM method actually to genotype. Yeah, after we actually perform sequencing on the orang asli, and these are some other um, uh, SIPs enzymes that actually we study in the orang asli. So um, again, you know, SIP uh, this SIP two C nine star three were found to be like you know in 18% of the orang asli compared to 4% in the Malays. So there are like four times higher uh, frequency of this uh, polymorphism in the orang asli. So um, similarly, you know, we went on to look in CYP2C9, uh, CYP2C19, and um, well, 10% of them are ultra rapids, whereas uh, about 22 or 25% of them are actually intermediate or poor metabolizer. So um, overall, what I want to say here is that the orang asli are pretty much towards, you know, not going to respond to the modern medications. And that is also one of the reasons that we are seeing a lot of this orang asli not going to the you know hospitals to actually get treatment. Yeah. So um, yeah, further on with pharmacogenomic at Tamoxifen, we actually conduct this study in a sub in a cohort of uh, patients with breast cancer, All right? Basically, this is just to uh, 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 preview lah, to see, you know, tamoxifen actually is metabolized a lot by CYP2D6 to endoxifen, right? So, and this is the endoxifen with 100 times more potent efficacy than uh, tamoxifen. So, polymorphism of CYP2D6 really do have a role to play eh, in terms of efficacy of tamoxifen. So, in this study that we actually did in uh, uh, breast cancer patients, we found that uh, uh, patients who are carrying uh, genotypes that uh, we actually sort of like phenol convert it to IM, they actually have a very high risk of relapse. Yeah? Uh, the odd ratio of relapse is about um, 12 times higher risk of relapse in the orang asli. Yeah? I mean, in this uh, malaise uh, patients that have CYP2D6 IM. Right. So what we have done here is that because in our population, we have a higher percentage of people with intermediate metabolizer that actually have reduced metabolism and that resulting in them not able to convert tamoxifen to endoxifen and therefore they were actually uh, you know recorded uh, a higher rate of recurrence as well as metastasis in our uh, patients yeah um the next one that we uh, want to share was be because we also did a study in colorectal cancer patients, right? Uh, we actually looked into 5-FU uh, uh, efficacy in patients. And as we said here, uh, the reason why we look into 5-FU is because 5-FU is one of the first line drug that is used to treat uh, um, uh, colorectal cancer patients. We also look into ironeticon actually, because uh, these two are used in Malaysia. And there are combination uh, therapy that is used under the, uh, what do you call that, a regime. Yeah? For example, 4-FOX is using 5 uracil but also uh, oxaliplatin and leucoverin, whereas 4 is 5-FU plus leucoverin and irinotecan. So these are the agent uh, drugs that actually used commonly to treat colorectal cancer. And we actually look into a cohort of uh, colorectal cancer patients. We look into the potential of using uh, DPYD genotyping in actually, uh, you know, looking into their risk of 5-FU uh, adverse reaction. 
right? Uh, this is basically a gun chat to say that you know DPYD are actually involved in the metabolism of uh, 5-FU. Yeah? So from our study, we found that uh, actually we genotype patient for uh, DPYD star 5 as well as uh, 1896, right? And uh, then we classify them according to, uh, you know, uh, whether they're going to have a normal kind of enzymes or partial deficiency. Those with heterozygosity of these two SNPs are being classified or categorized as having partial deficiency of this DPD enzyme. Whereas those with homozygous mutant are classified as having uh, deficiency. So we actually uh, measure the level of 5-FU in this patient and uh, patients with normal enzyme activity, you know, the level recorded in the study was about 0 0.83, whereas those with partial deficiency was 2.57. And the other patients with, you know, complete deficiency of um, this uh, DPD enzyme was actually 11.57. Then, then you can see that actually is pretty significant in terms of uh, the level that was attained by patients with different genotype status, right? And uh, that basically also uh, uh, give us a note that, um, you know, these patients with a high level of 5F, uh, 5FU, right, which can be predicted, predicted using genotyping, and they are actually uh, at increased risk, potentially higher toxicity in this patient group, right? Then we also look into irinotecan uh, po uh, uh, polymorphism of UGT1A1 in patients uh, because uh, you know uh, UGT1A1 basically uh, responsible for irinotecan uh, toxicity. Uh, irinotecan has been approved yeah, for uh, to treat metastasis CRC colorectal cancer. Uh, that's why, it, uh, and, and in Malaysia, uh, is, is also being used. So we need to know, right, the percentage of polymorphism of, uh, irinotecan in Malaysia. And this is, uh, the adverse effect that has been reported in our population with regards to, uh, irinotecan toxicity. So again, uh, uh, UGT, basically UDP glucuronicil transferase, yeah, it is involved in actually, uh, detoxif Fighting this metabolite SN38. Yeah. So SN38 is a toxic metabolite for irinotecan, uh, converted by carboxyl as carboxyl yeah? And UGT1A1 is required to reactivate it. So uh, patients with polymorphism or uh, deficiency of UGT1A1 would have a lot of SN38. Uh, well, sorry, will have uh will not have this uh. Uh, deactivated SN38, yeah. So they will have a toxic uh, SN38. Sorry. So uh, the polymorphism of UGT1A1 that has been commonly uh, studied is the TA repeats. Either there is a five copy or six or seven or eight copy. All right, and this is actually in the promoter region of UGT1A1, and uh, this uh, TA repeats has been inversely correlated with gene transcription efficiency and therefore the enzyme activity. So present of seven repeats compared to the normal genotype of six repeats actually has been uh, labeled as UGT1A1 star 28. And this star 28 has been re uh, associated with reduced gene expression and therefore reduced or glucuronidation activity in uh, in patients. So in North America, there has been 10% uh, of uh, patients or individual being uh, recorded as having deficiency of or being having homozygous of UGT one A one star twenty eight, and in European, you know about thirty eight point seven percent. In Malaysia, we want to look into how many percent that we have. So besides star twenty eight, there are actually other polymorphism that is that that is already being detected uh, in uh, UGT one A one as well. Yeah. So we did a study in the our population, and we found that forty percent of our Malays in Malaysia. Are actually having risk of uh, uh, toxicity if they are put on uh, irinotecan because as we can see here, uh, about 35% of them are actually having heterozygosity of 6TA and 7TA, whereas, uh, yeah, and another 8% of the Malays are having homozygous of uh, star 28. 
Yeah. So it's is is more than five percent of the population yeah, of the Malay that are at increased risk of um um irinotecan toxicity. Whereas the Chinese, as you can see, uh they are about five percent, right? And among the Indian, they are about uh eight point eight percent, right? So uh um well, the, the doctor will always ask, you know, if we genotype them, what should we do? I mean, what can we do? So if we genotype them, we're going to be able to predict that these people will be at an increased risk of grade 4 neutropenia. Yeah? And uh, because there are already sufficient data that have exist to say that homozygous, uh, patients with homozygous of star 28, they actually are at increased risk of neutropenia. So... The options available for the doctors is either you can accept the greater uh, toxicity by these patients, or you can reduce the dose, yeah, or you can actually use alternative regimen. Because uh, there is uh, actually uh, this is actually a meta analysis, right? Looking at uh, this UGT one A one star twenty eight genotype, yeah, and this irinotecan induced neutropenia. Actually, uh, they have found that low dose of irinotecan they are safe to be used, yeah, with regards to uh, different genotypes of star twenty eight. However, in patients with uh, medium dose as well as high dose, you know, uh, genotype of the patients will be very important, yeah, because uh, patients with homozygous mutant will be at an increased risk of toxicity or neutropenia at higher dose, yeah. But for lower dose, you don't see that kind of, uh, there is no uh, genotypic effect there. So another drugs that we look into the polymorphism and uh of uh, TP TPMT yeah, in our population to see uh you know is there a, a relevant of us to actually do pregenotyping in patients uh TPY TPMT um enzyme has been actually required to uh you know inactivate six mecaptopurine the active drug so so uh, patients with uh low TPMT will have increase of uh, uh the thiopurine toxicity and therefore they also at an increased risk of secondary neoplasm uh yeah Whereas too high a TPMT activity also will actually decrease therapeutic effect. So what it needs to what it tells us here is we actually need to know the activity of the TPMT uh, uh, activity for us to be able to dose uh, your our patients properly with, with mecaptopurine drugs, right? So um yeah uh, about ninety percent of patients with homozygous uh wild type allele right they usually metabolize these uh the substrates uh, for example mecaptopurine uh, normally and therefore toxicity is low but however the lapse is higher uh and the poor metabolizer right the toxicity is high and uh. And from that poor metabolizer, 0.3% of them are basically having homozygous of this TPMT uh, uh, gene. And they are actually at an increased risk of myelosuppression as well as secondary. So uh, then after that, we actually look into um, genotypes. We try to see uh, genetic polymorphism or transporter protein like ACC2 uh, as well as L. SLCO1B1 enzyme with uh, patients the, uh, that has been reported with metotrexate toxicity, right? And we actually plotted this as we can see here, uh, these uh, genotypes or uh, polymorphism or ABCC2 were actually significantly associated with serum level of metotrexate at 48 hours. Yeah? Uh, and uh, this, uh, we found three common, uh, metotrexate toxicity in patients. That is leukopenia, uh, and then, uh, liver enzyme change and thrombocytopenia. And, uh, this, uh, again, ABCC2, right, as well as ARID5B was found to be associated with leukopenia, uh, great kind of, uh, toxicity. So, um, well, we have not done a case control study, but this is just a, a, a study to show us they are uh, potentially using uh, genotyping of ABCC1 as well as this RIT5B to actually uh, pre-genotype patients before we put patients on um, uh, metatrizate. 
Then we also look into the metabolomics of these patients on metatrazate, right? We actually look into patients before giving uh, metatrazate as well as after metatrazate. And what we have detected is, you know, uh, patients pre and post metatrazate, they show a significant differences in terms of purine metabolism, right? As well as in alpha linoleic acid. Uh, metabolism and strict acid cycle metabolism. So these three metabolism pathways were sort of like uh, differentially expressed eh, in patients before they are treated with metotrexate as versus they are treated with metotrexate. All right. Uh, and then we were uh, we were trying to see if we can actually find another marker, a metabolite marker, for us to uh, uh, see. You know, we can uh, predict patients' response yeah, uh, for metotrexate. And we found that xanthine, uh, uh, metabolite of xanthine, uh, we a uh, VIP score of 2.61, uh, they were found to be higher right, in patients before they are treated with metotrexate. Right. After being treated with metotrexate, when the patients responded, they actually have a lower level of uh, xanthine, right? So, and then we did an LCMS MS on that metabolite, and that metabolite was found to actually uh, to be true. It was xanthine. So, uh, of course, this is our pre rim study, and then we will actually have to uh, reconfirm whether or not xanthine can be used as a marker, yeah, in a bigger study. Right, I think uh, with that, uh, being, I think we have done a couple of uh, uh, pharmacogenomic uh, toxicity uh, kind of um, studies. So next, what we have to do is we need to actually make sure the tests actually are made cheaper uh, so that it actually be uh, can be actually implemented in the clinics, right? And also uh, because of that, we actually develop uh, targeted kind of in-house AC so that uh, we can actually offer that to the doctors and they can actually genotype the patients. And we also have a startup company actually that make, uh, make um, uh, this test, you know, uh, being uh, available uh, at a, a easier and a cheaper cost to the uh, clinics actually. So I think with that, um, yeah, um, I do hope in Malaysia we can actually take up pharmacogenomic testing uh, so that we can actually give the right medicine to the right patients, uh, even at the right dosage, yeah, at the correct time. Especially, and this basically is very important for uh, patients with uh, um, cancers because uh, the cancer cells basically they progress so fast and they mutate also. And uh, you know the the right dose, the correct dose. It's very important to actually kill the cancer cells before they actually metastasis. Uh, I think with that, um, yeah, um, in order to make this, uh, you know, pharmacogenetics implemented, I think there is a lot of collaborations that needs to be done in the countries, uh, you know, so that we can share the data as well. Yeah, I think with that, uh, yeah, um, uh, I would like to thank all the sponsors of all the projects that we have conducted, including UATM. The Ministry of Higher Education and also the Pharmacogenomic Global Research Network, yeah, that actually have sponsored some of our projects. Uh, with that, yeah, thank you very much.